everyone. Good morning, Peter. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Um, tell us briefly, what is Uber Cash? What is Uber Cash? Uh, so Uber Cash is our way of storing value at Uber for our riders and eaters. And it's uh, a simple uh, a way to top up your balance and be able to avoid having to think about having cash in your hand and stuff like that. We launched it first in the US and recently uh, took it and rolled it out in Mexico and Brazil. What are the advantages to Uber as a company for offering this service? So primarily in our cash markets, which are very big in Latin America, we see it as an improvement on safety in, in a couple of vectors. So we have a lot of um, a big commitment that we have to do to make our experience for customers, whether they are the rider or the driver, as safe as possible. And one of the things that happens in our cash markets is you end up either at the beginning or the end of the trip with some, some possibilities of uh, friction. So the friction might be you get to the end of the trip and you realize you don't have enough money. And the driver says, hey, you really need to pay for the whole trip. And you're like, I've got no money. And so one of the things that we do for the driver at that point is instead of asking the rider to go to an ATM, which often happens, uh, we'll actually just tell the driver, don't worry about it. We'll give you the money and we'll pay you with Uber Cash on the back end so you don't have to think about it. That's solving our underpayment issue. On the overpayment side of things, where a customer says, hey, I'll give you $100 and the trip's only 40 and the, the, the rider is asking for their change, oftentimes the driver doesn't have change and, uh, and or doesn't want to waste time thinking about it and so forth. And so we, we automatically just top up the rider's Uber cash balance. And it, again, it's just trying to reduce the chance that there's any friction at, at the trip beginning and end. And it's trying to bring that magical experience that we pioneered in, the, in the, the credit card world to cash markets. How many, I mean, how much, how many people use cash for their, for their rides? How much, of it are, is a, how much of a problem is cash for you guys? Cash is not a problem. Cash is a massive opportunity for us. Uh, it's nearly 30% of wow. trips. So it's a big deal. Worldwide. Worldwide. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a, a significant number of our customer engagement is that the, the open access that is provided with cash. So if you think what we do at Uber, our job is to make sure that everyone can pay the way they want to pay. And paying the way they want to pay in some markets means a credit card, in some markets means paying with PayPal or Venmo, some markets it means cash, and cash is the universal access. Mm -hmm. So as we have grown and expanded, it's not possible to implement every form of payment in every country, uh, even though I've got a pretty big team. At some point we run out of uh, vendors and, and partners we can integrate with. So we re rely on cash as that last, last opportunity. And it's really interesting. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's not a socioeconomic thing. It's across all of our riders and, and customers and drivers and partners. Some of our drivers really love receiving cash because it's instant payment. Um, but then that actually creates a different problem, which is at the end of the day, the drivers have to pay us. Mm. So we have uh, deployed with a bunch of partners and, and relationships over 400,000 places where drivers can drop off the cash to pay us back for the commission for the trip. Let's talk about the economics of, of having that kind of wallet, the, the Uber cash wallet as opposed to paying with cash. Um, I imagine this is also a way for you to, to work around some of the interchange fees that come with, with, with credit and debit cards. Yeah, so um, you know, I have a couple of different hats that I have to wear. One of the hats is uh, we call it find the money at Uber, where we're trying to optimize our economics. And um, payment costs at Uber are very significant. And one of the things that we look at is all the different ways we can help reduce those costs. And a prepaid value, which has one-time one charges, is particularly efficient for us, especially as we get into lower and lower price trips. Mm -hmm. So pool trips, uh, things with jump. Mm -hmm. So if the trip itself is only $2 and you top up for 100 that's saving uh, significant uh, costs across interchange and, and bank processing fees and so forth. So yeah, it's a huge, huge uh, win for us in that respect. And it's also good for the consumer behavior. They actually don't want to see 25 jump rides on their American Express statement that say $2.20. They actually just want to see topped up my Uber cash for 100 and, and that's simpler. We still give them their receipts, so they still know how they spend, but we make it much, much easier on them in terms mm -hmm. of keeping track of their budget. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, though, you're taking deposits from the public, right? What, uh, what do the regulators say about this? So we've, um, we obviously, we're regulated in many markets, and we're very, very much, my team's very focused on financial compliance. 
So very recently, we got our e-money license issued in Europe, and that was a big project uh, across a lot of teams with uh, optimizing for KYC and AML and all of those capabilities and making sure that we were completely buttoned up as an organization to truly operate money uh, in a financial services type, kind of type of way. Mm. We, do, we follow the same patterns in all the different markets and have been uh, very, very focused on compliance for as long as the company's been around. On the, and the, the way to think about it is this. We're already paying out drivers in 70-ish countries right now. And as we did that, we had to on onboard them and make sure that they were KYC and not uh, subject to sanction screening and all of that sort of thing. So built into our DNA, in my team's DNA, is the ability to make sure that the work that we do fits and, and complies with all the regulations mm -hmm. in every market. So when you're um, charging people via stored value as opposed to via a credit or a debit card, how do you manage the issue of fraud or chargebacks or those kinds of things that are typically managed by a card company? Uh, so I have two teams. One team is the payments team, and the payments team is responsible for taking money from riders, finding it, taking a little bit for us, and passing the rest on to drivers. So that's the inflow and the outflow of all the money across all of Uber, whether it's rides, eats, freight, jump, Nemo, uh, jump is Nemo, and, and, and any one of our businesses. The other part of my team, which is uh, a pretty busy team, is the risk and fraud team. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a big organization that focuses in on monitoring every transaction, uh, figuring out whether you are you, I am me, whether this relationship is going to be okay in, a, in an Uber and a pool ride, and saying, okay, let's navigate that. And the risk and fraud team treats every Uber cash transaction just like every other credit transaction. What's uh, a little bit interesting about the payments business for e-commerce, because we're considered e-commerce even though we're not really, um, is that all of the chargeback fraud basically falls back on us anyway. So we pay all the interchange and, um, and take all of those expenses, but when push comes to shove, because it's card not present, we eat all those costs. So what that means is I've built up a really big, we've built up a really big team that focuses on driving those costs down because it's material and we have to treat every trip as uh, something we want to be caring about. So you're trying to get ahead of things anyway, regardless of how the customer's paying, you're saying? Correct. We have to do it no matter what. And we, we, we're thinking about all different sorts of things from driver deduping, where drivers have the, they Photoshop their driver's license because we de delisted them and they come back on the platform, to um, thinking about how do we help de-anonymize riders. So we have real issues in some markets where at the end of the day, a driver becomes a target because they've got cash in their pocket. Mm. And so we, we spend a lot of time and we rolled out a feature in Brazil, for example, where riders are required to upload their CPF. Mm. So we can actually do a quick KYC and identity check on the, drive, on the rider as well. And that's helping reduce the, the chance for safety incidents. That's interesting. And I imagine there's a lot of AI there in the background as well, kind of monitoring. No AI, lots of ML. Okay. Yeah, I'm an anti-AI person. I don't think it actually exists. But we have a lot of machine learning. So we actually have a bunch of trained models we have a huge team in the Philippines that's uh, spot checking every incident, every trip, uh, every suit, uh, use case, checking for false positives and checking for false negatives as well. So it's 400-ish plus people that spend all day helping us train the models. Wow. Um, how do you how do you how do you encourage people? I think you kind of sit out of the the use case when it comes to actually using cash. If people have too much or not enough, then you use the the stored value system to kind of smooth that out. But for people who are used to paying for their Ubers with their debit card or their credit card, it's already very frictionless. How do you, how do you encourage them to make that kind of leap? I mean, or do, you, do you not uh, worry about Absolutely that? we do. So we give them incentives. So I'll do it in US dollars because I'm not sure of the, the exact ratio we do in Brazil and Mexico. But in the US, if you top up 100, it only costs 95. So we're giving you 5% discount in order to top up your balance. So we create incentives that encourage you to do that, and, there's, um, a, and it's just straight up incentives. Mm -hmm. We've also found that there's that whole bunch of people that use it just purely as a budget. So they say, I will set up $100 a week or $100 a month as my spend on Uber, and then they sort of effectively don't use their debit card mm -hmm. until they run out, and then mm -hmm. they sort of use that as a way to understand what they want to spend each month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about the percentage of users maybe that are using the Uber Cash feature? How, how popular is it? How quickly is it growing? So I can say it's really popular, but I can't tell you the sort of ratios of things. We don't really talk about mix of payments and stuff mm -hmm. like that too much. 
Um, but we're really pleased with how it's going, and we're seeing a lot of traction, uh, particularly from our debit card users. Um, so counter counterintuitively, um, it's less popular probably from credit, um, yeah. because the, the trade-off is you're not losing rewards, which you might lose on credit. Right, right. Do you expect it to continue growing? Do you want this to, like, what's kind of the vision for this product? So uh, my team's uh, actively working to get Ubercash deployed in all of our markets. Uh, we've deployed it uh, quite successfully in, in Egypt and, and a couple of like, other places like that. And the, and the customer attraction is really high because the customers are actually much more comfortable with digital wallets in those markets. Mm -hmm. uh, we're progressively rolling out across almost all of LATAM. It should be done by the end of next month, as far as I know. End of next month. Well. Yeah. So it's very much part of every, all of our marketplace mm -hmm. dynamics because we think, think it's just fundamentally good. And what we actually see as people start to adopt it more is a little bit more activity on the platform as well. As in people use, people are coming back to Uber more regularly for? Yeah, because they have one less thing to think about. So if previously they had to worry about carrying cash around and stuff like that. And now they actually have a, a balance. They want to come and spend it. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee this remaining a closed loop? Uh, system, or do you think that, I mean, is there the potential for further integrations with, like, beyond the, the Uber ecosystem? We haven't talked yet about any expansion in that way, um, but what we are seeing is there's a lot of uh, services on our platform, like Jump and others, that uh, as we create more and more different ways to, to interact with Uber, those things become more and more important. Um, what we have done in the US is test a driver debit card. So we're taking driver earnings and allowing the drivers to pay themselves in real time. And that's been really, really popular. And so as we look at that problem of how do we get the drivers access to their money as quickly as possible, that's something that we're exploring really quickly. Why are you doing that via a debit card? Because the drivers need some way to pay. So uh, right now, in general, on Uber, you have to have a bank account as a, as a partner of ours because we need to pay you. And the costs of payment vary by market. In some markets, we wire the money from the US. So we will spend six bucks to pay a driver 200. Wow. Um, and, and, and we don't charge them. So that, that's just the commitment we have, that every week you should get a weekly payment mm -hmm. from, from us, reflecting the earnings you had on the platform. Mm -hmm. In many markets, we now have flex pay, which means you can pay once per day. Uh, and then now we're, uh, we've really shown that there's a high traction for drivers wanting, and partners wanting to get access to their earnings as quickly as possible. And the test point for that is we launched the debit card in the US, and what we're seeing is some drivers paying themselves up to five times a day. So they'll start the day uh, often with a, a zero balance because they've spent everything they had. And we've built into the debit card overdraft, so they can actually buy gas, go negative $50, get on the road, uh, buy, literally go and uh, drive, pay us back for that, and then make money. And maybe by the end of the day, maybe they need to take their kids out of daycare so they'll cash out, take the money, give the cash to their daycare provider, and move on. Mm -hmm. And that connection between what I earned and what I get to take as mine is mm -hmm. something really fundamentally useful. And mostly because most of, many of our driver partners tend to have the least good banking relationships. They tend to have the most fee-inducing payments. So they tend to get the, the product from a retail bank that has the most fees. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe has bad overdraft fees and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And we've focused much more on how do we unlock that behavior of it's their money, we should let them have it as soon as possible. And it's interesting that the most economic way of doing that is via a debit card. For, uh, for them, it's free, right? So, right. Uh, and for us, it's very in inexpensive for us to top up a debit card yeah. in real time. Yeah, yeah. Um, interesting that you mentioned the, the cross-border payments aspect of, of things. This is simply because Uber has not, you would need to set up a local entity in each country in order to be able to pay people locally, is that? Um, so, uh, so in some markets, it's just difficult to get a banking, a local bank partner. Right. Uh, in most cases, we've got direct connections and our bank partners are all over the place. But there are just some markets where you can't find an easy way to do it, so mm. it's easier to wire it in. Um, and or the scale isn't very big. So as we focus, as my team focuses on supporting our business growing globally, we might go into a new market and, and the, the operations team says, we want to launch next week. 
And I'm like, well, we can't integrate a bank in a week. And so the short term might be we'll do a wire for payouts and stuff like that. I see. So I it's, see. it's both a, a combination of speed to market and the global growth because we grow continuously. It's kind of a fun place to do, mm -hmm. to be. Uh, combined with what's the local fastest way to get the money into the driver's hands. It seems like you guys are managing quite a large kind of flow of, of, of money, right, in terms of overdrafts to the drivers and top-ups if the, if, the, if the passenger doesn't have enough cash, as well as those payouts. Tell us a bit about the technology behind that and the way you manage it. Uh, so it's pretty much all homegrown, which is a uh, testament to the amazing team we have. Uh, we have our own fundamental payments platform. Uh, we connect to pretty much everything. So if you're a fintech in LATAM, we've probably connected to you. Um, and we seek to combine connections to the big guys like Stripe and Adyen and Braintree and so forth with all of the things that are expedient. Unfortunately, in payments, everybody's market is different, down to a country, sometimes down to a city. And so we've, we've got to adapt to all those needs. Mm. So we basically have a dynamic way of ingesting funds, depending on payment method. And it could be a Boleto payment, it could be anything. All the way through then uh, a supply chain that says, how do we allocate it? We have a huge team in tax and um, statements and invoicing and receipts. There's a whole team that generates all the different types of receipts for all different parts of the world. And then the, the refund receipts, and, you know, and, then, and those are all regulated. So we, we have all those layers of teams that support all of that. Um, and that gives us the flexibility then on the disbursement side, on the payout side, to be able to dynamically decide today it's cheaper to send it over a debit card than it is to send it over a bank account or a wire or so on. And because we have all the flexibility in-house, we can drop in new partners whenever we're ready, and it means we can grow really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Layered into all of that is a global KYC and compliance and identity team and a sanctioned screening team and you name it, all the things you can imagine. Um, Moving beyond Uber, because you have a very interesting background in, in financial technology and, and payments, I'm interested in getting your views a bit more broadly on the future of paying and the future of mobile wallets. What do you see as the big, the big friction in the payments industry more broadly at the moment? Um, I, think, I think the challenge is right now there's a whole bunch of folks competing for a wallet. Uh, I used to do one at Google. We called it cunningly Google Wallet. <laughs> um, uh, and it's been renamed Android Wallet, Android Pay, Google Pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we, I, I've been on that side of the game. I've uh, spent a bunch of time with the folks at Apple, with Apple Pay, because mm -hmm. we, it's a really great partner for us at Uber. That's truly frictionless. New user to Uber with Apple Pay, they just go. It just works. There's no setup. It just works. It's fantastic. So the Apple Pay experience works really great. But what very few people have figured out is why someone should want to have their money in a wallet other than as a convenience. Mm. So Apple Pay is super convenient, and, and Google Pay, the equivalent on Android, equally convenient. Why would that become the center of my financial life? Mm. There's not a clear answer to that. Mm. I think uh, every bank and their brother has tried to do it. Itaú has just launched one again in Brazil. Um, and I think the struggle there is what does, what's in it for the consumer? And for us at Uber, we have a really interesting consumer base of three and a half-ish million people that we pay every week uh, and, create, uh, and pay their earnings to them every week who are earning on the platform. We have this really great connection to them that we help them in their financial lives every day. And if we can turn the, that money that they've earned into something more valuable, if it stays with us in their debit card by doing deals for them, and mm -hmm. basically our goal is to sort of take every dollar earned and make it 20% more valuable in the real world, that's a really sticky connection. And that's something that actually has meaning. And we already have that relationship with them. So I think what you'll start to see is people start to really focus on why are they actually putting their money where it is, what's, what's in it for them. Um, and there'll be communities that form sort of like the old days of the credit unions that were forming in the 50s and 60s. And that, that community aspect will be something that will be really central to success. So we are speaking to an audience of banks here who are, many of them, working on their own digital yeah. wallets and digital apps. Do you, you would say then that, that working out a reward system is basically the essence to, to getting people on board? 
I think if you're a retail bank and you're just saying, I'm going to digitize myself better with a mobile wallet experience, I think that's cool. Um, but I think that the opportunity is to actually try and do something that's meaningfully better for the person that's receiving the money. Uh, Greenhouse, which is a cool experiment by the Wells Fargo guys here in the US, was an idea of focusing in on how do you position a bank within a bank and this idea of financial inclusion and wealth creation, or not wealth creation, just savings mm -hmm. for, for customers, was a new way of dis distinguishing why does this wallet and why does this experience exist. Mm. Um, you know, I built probably PFM for every major retail bank on the planet, and that's a start, but what you have to do is integrate the actual actions that you want the people to do. Don't just tell them what's wrong, help them and fix the problem for them. What is that? What kind of problem? Can you give a kind of a concrete example of like a concrete example? Is most people in the U.S., allegedly an, an affluent and wealthy country, can't afford to fix the glass on their car if they get a scratch. Three hundred fifty bucks. Fifty percent of the U.S. can't do that. They have no savings and no access to capital. That's kind of bad. Yeah. And for us at Uber, uh, we. We want them to be able to keep earning, mm -hmm. so we will find ways to help them with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if we talk about the rewards and mobile mobile apps. Might we get to a future? Maybe we're not so far away from the future. You know, we talk about people who have multiple credit cards and they have all sorts of different rewards, and it's so hard to keep track of it all. Are we at risk of getting to a similar situation with wallets? Um, I think yes. But I also think that the, the challenge will be, un, unless you're native to the phone, it'll be really, really hard to be successful. So there's, there's, a, there's a reason why Apple Pay and Google Pay are built into the device, and to a lesser extent, Samsung Pay, because it's the, it's the centerpiece. You and I, we have a wallet or a purse or one thing, mm. and that's the center of gravity for our receipts and for our expense. And, and yes, there's the top of wallet conundrum of whose credit card do I see when I open my wallet the first time. And yes, there's a little holder for cash, hence Uber Cash and Apple Pay Cash and so forth. But that metaphor is, it's not an invalid metaphor. People aren't gonna have two wallets. In the real world, what about in the digital world? In the and future, in the digital do world. Do you think there's gonna be one wallet that I think for dominates? most users, they will have one thing that they use. Mm. And there will be a bunch of fintech nerds like me that will have every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but for the average consumer, the confusion will be trumped by, I just chose one, I got stuck to it, I got enough incentives. And yeah, if you pay me a ton of money, I'll switch. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be just like switching credit cards. You'll be bet, embedded and wedded to it. And your sense of connection to it will be the thing that keeps you using it. So you think that there's a race right now to onboard customers to, to your wallet, not necessarily your wallet, but for, for financial institutions to kind of get as many people on board as they can because the cost of switching down the track is going to be? 100%. Yeah, absolutely, which is why you see um, tons of folks trying to claim a space and trying to claim that human behavior mm. because I think it's very, very sticky. Mm. And then it's really expensive to switch. You know, the CAC of... A deposit checking account in the U.S. is between 350 and 500 bucks. The which customer is acquisition cost. The cost of acquisition mm -hmm. for a customer, and that's what a bank is expecting to pay to get someone to start dropping in their paycheck. And that's a pretty sticky relationship. It gets double sticky when you set up some bill pay, mm -hmm. and people don't change that. Mm -hmm. And now we've made it easier on most people by making it easy to move the money once it's stuck there, so you can leave your bill pay set up over here and actually live over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and that's cool, but the, the transaction cost for the user is high, mm. and yeah, I think it'll be hard for people to switch. Wow, so the race is on, everyone. Get Absolutely. to it. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time. Pleasure. Please join me in thanking Peter. Thank you.